Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Trey Lockerbie. And today I'm super excited to have back on the show, Mr. Scott Lynn of Masterworks. Welcome back, Scott. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. Well, first of all, I need to congratulate you because since we last spoke, Masterworks has grown considerably and has now surpassed the unicorn status with a valuation over $1 billion, which, you know, that's got to feel good. You raised, <laughs> you raised <laughs> that, over that, a, that does feel good. Yeah. <laughs> I bet that feels good. You raised over a hundred million dollars uh, for a Series A, which is you know staggering. What will that money be going towards? Yeah, it's you know it's a good question. I mean, we we get asked this a lot. So the the core business today is profitable. Um, we're we're growing like crazy. We're hiring 20, 30 people a month. Um, I think we'll be over. 300 people by year end. I can't remember the last time I was on, I think it was over a year ago. Uh, you know, we, th this year we'll buy over a billion dollars in art. Uh, so we've quickly become the largest buyer in the art market. So when we think about how do we, how do we deploy capital? Some of it's just balance sheet capital needed for, um, for purchasing paintings. Uh, some of it is, is operating expenses, hiring people, uh, building out teams, we're, uh, we're investing heavily in research, we're investing heavily in data analytics, understanding different dynamics in the art market, where we think it makes sense to invest. Um, so really, really across the board, but, you know, we're just, we're super excited about the opportunity ahead. I mean, our, our belief continues to be that this is the largest asset class that's never been securitized. And for the very first time, we're, we're making it investable. So, you know, that's, that's a, that's a huge scope of work. Talk to us a little bit about the team. You know, you mentioned it's been a year since you were on the on the show. What does the team look like nowadays? How has it grown since the fundraise? Well, I, I can't even. You know, it's funny. The fundraise was only four months ago. It feels like it was a year ago. But uh, I think we're about 175 people now. Um, you know, again, we'll be we'll be above 300 by the end of this year, and and we're really building out the the core functions for the business, right? So. Um, from a from a retail perspective, sales, uh, onboarding new investors, we're onboarding more than a thousand new investors a day now. Um, marketing, uh, research, and, and when we think about research, we think about both macro research, understanding the art market at a very high level, uh, how is it appreciating, uh, how is it correlated to other asset classes, and then we think about kind of the low level dynamics around which artist markets do we think are most investable, uh, what signals are we looking for to believe that artist markets will accelerate in the future um, as well as just all, all the standard sort of shared services functions in any any company now talk to us a little bit about what that fundraising process looked like you know you brought it to market how did you bring it to market who got in on it what did it look like for you yeah it's not my it's not my first rodeo so i've, I've done this several times before and it, you know we we have the uh, the good fortune of having tons of investor interest, so we really took a handful a handful of firms that were interested in the business that I that I knew personally. Um, hired Goldman, I think, start to finish. It, it took uh, what, what do we count? I think it was roughly forty days, which is unheard of. Um, so you, you know, it was a it was a super super fast, very very selective process. And the investors. That came in. Are are they looking at Masterworks as a play on the mark on the art market itself, or on the fractional ownership collectibles market? What was the angle that they? You know, what was the appeal for them exactly? I think the really high level thesis that everyone is very excited about is if you if you subscribe to this notion that venture and private equity is roughly a three and a half trillion dollar asset class. And you believe that art is one and a half trillion, but there's 9,000 firms that help people allocate to venture and private equity, and there's only us in the art market, you just immediately see what a, what a huge opportunity that is, um, and almost to a certain extent become valuation agnostic. And I, and I think that's how a lot of people approach it very, very early, which is, I think there's a lot of data to suggest that this is, is literally the largest asset class that has no investment products left, right? Every every other major asset class has been securitized, and there's there's lots of competition. So this is this is one of the few where we're still in the very very early days. 
You touch on an interesting point there about the valuation and the fact that there's so much money in private equity and VCs. When you're getting above that threshold of a billion dollars, I'm always curious as to why owners choose to stay private instead of going public. You know, that said, Sotheby's was once public, for example, and then chose to go private. Masterworks seems like its model would make for a great public company or constantly raising capital to buy art and things like that and having the access to those markets. Walk us through the decision to continue to stay private and maybe if there's aspirations to be public one day in the future. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good, it's an interesting question for us, right? Because we, we are the largest filer of public offerings with the SEC. Now we fire, file one about every five and a half days. Um, and you know, I, I think, I think where we are today, we just don't have the, um, the bandwidth to, to, to be a public company, but we do believe that this fundamentally will be at some, some point in time. So it, it's, it's really probably more of a prioritization thing with us right now than, than anything else. You know, on that note, I'm curious about the, you mentioned securitizing all the time. I mean, I'm, I'm curious about some of the paintings that you currently carry or own or are listed. And if possibly you would spin those off to be their own publicly traded entity at some point, I mean, just the art itself. I mean, some of these are entering stratospheric valuations on their own. Is that something you, that you could see being uh, viable in the future? You mean you mean actually having the paintings be exchange listed? Um, yeah, yeah. It, it, you 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 can certainly you can certainly see a world where that makes sense for very expensive paintings. Um, probably makes more sense for a fun type product uh, that's that's you know publicly publicly traded. Um, but yeah, I mean we we definitely think that liquidity is one of the key challenges with the asset class. So I think. Any, any additional mechanisms or features to make the asset class more liquid just allows it to be more accessible to, to any type of investor. And obviously, you guys are kind of building that marketplace, which I know is incredibly valuable as well. But are there other aspirations to potentially bundle up some of these pieces of art into, say, like an EFT or something that could be exchange traded? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're right now working on fun products um, that will give people broad exposure to all paintings on the Masterworks platform so investors don't have to pick and choose paintings. Um, and that I, that I think will be very, very well received. We're, we're testing um, kind of, you know, slow rolling some of those products into market now. Um, so I, I do think that's interesting. Now, now an ETF is, a, is, a, is an amazing product that we, we would love to bring to market. It really requires us to have each underlying painting be very liquid. And although we have a secondary market today where investors are trading shares and all of these works of art, uh, you know, the, the liquidity is not like a, uh, an exchange traded security where you can, you can get out of a position in, in seconds. Um, so I think, I think that's a ways off, but that, that, that would obviously be the, the Holy grail type type product. What about um, the idea of, you know, mentioned these VCs getting involved. It's making me wonder if Masterworks itself would then one day have a venture arm, for example, for say, for say aspiring artists in their early days, having them, helping them get off the ground. You're giving them incredible exposure. You could see how you could kind of uh, exacerbate their success very quickly. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I, I, this weekend, I was actually at, uh, at a family event, and one of the friends of the family was was talking about how her son uh, is an artist, and and how you know how difficult it is to be an artist. And I was talking, you know, I was telling her some of the the stats in the art market. Like, for example, sixty one percent of sixty billion dollars that sells every year in the art market is from the top one hundred artists, most of which are deceased. So you, you very quickly understand just from that stat alone, how difficult it is to build a career as, as a new artist. I think one of the cool things about what we're doing, which isn't, you know, isn't totally appreciated today is that if we're able to bring billions of dollars into the art market, and as we start to, to allocate to more emerging artists, it does really make it, it much easier for new artists to enter the market if there's, there's kind of active um, people like us buying up buying up those paintings so we don't you know we don't we don't have that that product today it's more of a speculative um, product for emerging artists but but at some point I think that's an interesting 
interesting product that I'd, I'd love to roll out. That's awesome. So last year, I think you bought something like $400 million worth of art, you know, being you being Masterworks, and you're on track now, as you said, to put purchase over a billion dollars this year, which obviously sounds like a ton of money. But talk to us and kind of remind us about what that, how that compares to the overall art market as a whole. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. So it does sound like a ton of money in the art market in particular, right? Because there's, there's really nobody like us buying at scale, um, at that sort of scale. But the art market today, it, it, the estimates vary, but it's roughly a $60 billion a year transaction uh, volume market. So a billion dollars is still, you know, it's significant, but it's not, it's not over overpowering by, by any means. We are also starting to consider artists who are are modern like Picasso, impressionists like Monet. Uh, this year is part of our buying strategy, so we we expect to increase the number of artists that we bring to the platform beyond the 55 that we focused on historically, and then also move into some impressionist and modern categories, which which we haven't been in. Now you mentioned that Masterworks is profitable already. I'm kind of curious. We, I don't think it's something we really went into on our first episode together, which was episode 349. But talk to us a little bit about where and how Masterworks makes money in the process of people buying those fractional shares of the art itself. Yeah, it's all, so our, our management fees are really very much like um, um, private equity or, or a hedge fund. So we make 1.5% per year on... Um, uh, uh, assets under management, and then we make 20% profit uh, when we sell the painting in the future. So, you know, that's that's our our fee structure very, very broadly. I'm curious about that second point there about selling it in the future. So say, for example, a piece of art goes up on the website, it's auctioned off. We all own this fractional share of it. Who then determines how it sells again? I mean, we're, we got, we're obviously it's kind of publicly traded now and we're just selling shares on a secondary market at that point, but could someone actually feasibly come in and buy up the whole painting again, theoretically? Um, I, 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 we, we restrict the total ownership. So the, the most anyone can purchase is actually 20%. So that, so that technically could not, could not happen, but we, we, we decide when to sell the painting, right? So we have full discretion as the manager um, when to sell. And that's that's really important because the art market tends to be very event driven. So when an artist um, sets a price record, for example, it tends to be a great time to sell into that, to sell into that market because there's a lot of hype around the artist. Um, when there's a retrospective covering that artist's work, you know, again, there's a lot of a lot of momentum around that artist. So it's a good time to sell. So we 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 found that just generally the ability to act quickly, respond to, um, to inbound inquiries or otherwise is, is really important. So when I went onto the Masterworks site recently, I was actually surprised by the lack of offerings on the site <laughs> because you know you, you would expect it to be kind of flourishing with, with a bunch of different options, but there weren't really, which you know tells you a lot, I think, about your rigorous process to get listed on your platform in the first place. So talk to us a little bit about what goes into getting listed and how many you kind of expect to even list in a, say a year? Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. So, so now is the biggest buyer, we just get, we get, we get offered basically everything in the art market. So when you take, you know, if you look at individual artist markets, uh, George Kondo is a great example. I, I was going through the state of the other day. I think, I think we've been offered around 250 George Kondo paintings uh, over the past couple of years. And to put that in context, I mean, if you're a collector, and even if you're one of the biggest George Kondo collectors, you might get offered six George Kondos a year, twelve George Kondos a year. You know, you're you're never getting offered a couple hundred. Um, so we've purchased now. Uh, I, I may have this wrong, but I think we purchased four George Kondo paintings. So the the amount of work that our acquisitions team sees, reviews, analyzes. Um, frankly, rejects, I think speaks to the, the quality of offerings on the platform. And I, I fundamentally believe that there's, there's just no better way to invest in art or, or get exposure to the asset class um, outside of what we're doing today, just because of, of that dynamic alone. Like it's just, it's just not possible for any individual, or even a small team to review the volume of work that, um, 
that we're reviewing. But you know, to your to your to your point about there not being a lot on the platform, like the the other dynamic that we're seeing is the paintings are just selling out fast. So we we have one two million dollar painting sometimes that sell out in a day or less than a day. We had a seven million dollar Banksy uh, three or four weeks ago that sold out in two hours. Um, you know that that is it is part of a problem with the platform that that we'd like to um, we'd like to build some features around like possibly previewing offerings so people can understand what's what's coming up in the future rather than just relying on on when it launches. Hmm. Very interesting. You know, this is a very timely discussion because the markets have been just pummel you know pummeled this year already, and they're down big again today. It makes a lot of investors get, you know, start rethinking their strategies, so to speak. And I've heard you mention that the S and P five hundred correlated to the art market is very low. I think you said it was 0.14 at the at the time. Now, this could be a really good time for investors to start thinking about something like art. Not only the markets going down, but the risk of inflation and a number of other uh, macro themes. Now. Your strategy, and pardon this uh, this comparison, perhaps, but it's similar to how Michael Saylor has been using micro strategy in a sense <laughs> to be stacking Bitcoin on his balance sheet. Do you consider yeah. Masterworks, you know, stacking fine art on their balance sheet as somewhat of a similar thesis? Yeah, it's funny. I know Michael. Um, I, you know, it's not it's not a similar thesis, right? Like at the end of the day, we we acquire art and we believe in the asset class um, because we, we think it's, it, it just provides consistent uh, long-term returns. Right. Um, I think his, his thesis on, on Bitcoin is, is, is um, more extreme for lack of a, you know, <laughs> lack of a better word, but um, yeah, I mean, we, you know, we're, we're big believers in the asset class long-term. Obviously we have a lot of skin in the game because we have carry, uh in the paintings so we're we effectively have have equity um and everything that we're bringing to the platform and you know that is that is part of how we think about our balance sheet and, and how we think about long-term value of the of the business what is masterworks impact on the art market itself so say for example what's your take on the new liquidity you're bringing into the art market and how it affects the pricing does it compressed pricing due to the fact that there's more com competition or do you think it creates a premium since there's more dollars chasing fewer goods what has been kind of the what's the overall impact of this much interest uh going into the market yeah it's a really good question it's it's a question that we have uh thought a lot about from a research perspective um specifically and and we we think about less about these things in, in the context of today like today i don't i don't really think we're impacting prices in the art market that much but if we're raising five billion dollars a year in capital and we're buying five billion dollars a year in art would we be impacting prices and I, I think the answer is probably yes um and and then obviously that 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 begs the question of is that you know is that a bad thing and i think our view is that you know, art very similar to, to Bitcoin and the and the analogy that you just used um, is a is a it, the, the supply is not really increasing generally on an individual artist market level, right? In many cases, it's decreasing because people are donating paintings to museums. So if you bring in more demand with supply that's either fixed or decreasing, then then prices will go up. Um, we don't we don't really think that's a bad thing so long as new investors are coming into the market, right? So as long as we're exposing new investors to the asset class who are allocating to it as part of an investment strategy, um, we think that's, that's a, a healthy way to build um, an ecosystem that, that drives prices up over time. When you do list a new piece of work and you securitize it, how many shares do you start with when you're in the initial offering? It's really just the price divided by twenty dollars per share. So every IPO that we do is is a is a twenty dollar per share IPO, and that's actually a great way if you go to our secondary markets to understand how um, paintings have appreciated just based on how, how you know how they're trading versus versus twenty dollars. Has Massworks ever securitized a 
sculpture piece of work, uh, like a Jeff Koons, for example? You know, we haven't. I mean, we those those uh you know like a balloon dog is something that we've thought about historically coons's market has been one one of the more challenging markets um uh just from a uh, from an investment perspective so you know we haven't we haven't done that yet but we definitely would look at artists like Giacometti, for example who's who's always worked um in sculpture uh artists like calder uh the do the do mobiles so it isn't it isn't something we've done but but we certainly would now, you mentioned this earlier, but Massworks does spend a ton of resources on research. What research have you uncovered most recently that's really surprised you? Well, if I just think about the past couple of weeks, we, we tend to, uh, we're, we, we try to release one research piece, at least internally, if not externally, on a weekly basis. So uh, last week's was, was really about how art responds during inflation. And, you know, it's an, it's, it, it's an, it's a hard question because when we look at most of the data we have in the art market, um, at least statistically significant data, it goes back to the uh, early, early to mid 1980s. So we, we don't have great data from the 70s uh, into the 80s, which, which was, was kind of prime inflationary time in the US. Um, so it's it's hard for us to conclude one way or another. I think our position today is that art is inflation neutral, meaning that historically it's always outperformed inflation, but we can't exactly call it an inflation hedge. Although I think a lot of people would say that real assets generally are inflation hedges, um, but you know we we haven't technically been able to conclude that at this point in time. Now that's obviously more external research you're doing, meaning outside of the platform you've built. I imagine you're doing a number, a lot of research on the platform as well. I mean, talk to us about how you kind of allocate between research going from how the platform is performing to just general market research in the art, in the art market. Yeah. I guess when we think about the platform, we tend to think about what are, what are the business analytics um, around how, you know, how are people effectively investing um, we look at onboarding metrics, we look at uh, investing metrics. You know, one of the things that's, that's really fascinating about the business, which we, I didn't personally expect, and we um, have come to just take as, as belief at this point in time, is when, when someone invests um, a certain amount of money, let's say $10,000, we know that that person almost certainly over their life will invest roughly $90 per month thereafter. Um, and we've now for three years, we've at least in aggregate seen that seen that trend continue. So we we continue to see really, really good repeat investor behavior. And I think a lot of that is just people starting with small allocations as part of an overall portfolio, becoming more comfortable with the performance of the investment vehicles and then just growing those allocations over time. Now, when you mentioned sales and you and business analytics what came to my mind was the fact that maybe i'll, I'll go on masterworks look at a banksy and then i go on my instagram and it says hey we noticed you were interested in this banksy <laughs> i'm trying to redirect you back to the platform you know how do you think about that how do you think about driving people onto the platform to begin with i mean it's all today it's all online marketing and and word of mouth referrals um so we you know we do tons of online marketing have a big marketing team here uh, you know, my background is kind of starting a lot of different online advertising companies. So, um, have that experience and, uh, we rely heavily on it, right? Like we, we spend a lot of time and energy on figuring out how to market to people with portfolios generally above $500,000, um, and then educating them slowly on the art market and then eventually, um, selling them, uh, on one, on, on our platform and investment products. Now, going back to the inflation hedge kind of piece, um, you know, if someone were to go into the art market now, say to diversify for inflation or something else, it would seem almost natural that they'd want to go into something kind of blue chip, like a Rembrandt or something. Now, these pieces are only, you know, gaining maybe one or two percent, I think, on average uh, annually. So it's not a huge return, but it seems like a flight of safety, so to speak. So 
Talk to us about the risks there and how common it is for someone to actually lose money on, say, like a blue chip piece of work. Yeah. So we, we you know, one of the things that that I I want us to do this year from a research perspective is figure out how to better communicate risk in the asset class. And there's a few things that I find particularly fascinating about about the asset class um, personally. One is that, and and you you sort of alluded to this, but one is that. If you look at the performance of contempt uh, of art by segment and you go back in time what you see is the contemporary performs at 14 percent a year uh modern impressionist modern performs between six and ten percent a year and then you roll all the way back in history hundreds of years and old masters appreciate at call it one to two percent a year or or roughly that of inflation the thing that's so fascinating about that analysis is that you don't see a particular segment of the market in entirety that depreciates. So you see these these appreciation rates decline over centuries down to inflation like rates, and then the asset class exhibits basic store value characteristics. Um, we don't know why that is, and and we find that we find that really really fascinating from a uh, from a research perspective. So that's that's one of the things that we want to. Um, spend time on is to, to learn why does the asset class, at least in aggregate by segment, not depreciate? And then from an investor perspective, how do we better communicate the appreciation potential and the, the, the downside risk potential? Um, to, to get back to your, to your, to your more specific question, uh, you know, we, we don't see paintings sell for losses that often. And when, when, we, when we look at the data, what we look at is when a painting is purchased at public auction, then that same painting is subsequently sold, what percentage of time is there a loss? And look, depending on the, the time period that you look at, five years, 10 years, I think we look at seven years as well, um, that percentage loss rate is always less than 10%. And then when you look at the magnitude of loss when there is a loss, it's generally also immaterial. And, and qualitatively, what you see in the art market is that if someone buys a Monet for $10 million, it's just very unlikely that they turn around and they sell it 10 years later for $7 million. We, we just don't see that happen that often. Um, so perhaps that's just loss aversion on behalf of very wealthy individuals who, who are just unwilling to take losses. Um, perhaps that has to do with the fact that a lot of these artist markets, such as Monet, have declining supply. So as they have declining supply, prices are, are, are um, increasing because demand is constant or growing. Uh, we're, not, you know, we're not exactly sure, but it's, it's, a really, it's a really interesting characteristic. Now, when you were mentioning that the contemporary art appreciates at, say, 14% on average, when you go back to the ETFs, is that how you'll carve it up, so to speak? Just an ETF for the contemporary side of things, uh, an ETF for, you know, the blue chips. How would that look? Yeah, I think I think what we would want to do is we we would want to find individual artist markets um, that we find uh, interesting or investable, and we may even choose to equally weight those artists. Um, you know, it's it's funny in, in a lot of asset classes, equally weighted strategies are generally viewed as, as less interesting, I think. Hey, everybody, it's Trey Lockerbie from the We Study Billionaires podcast here to tell you about Titan. If you're ready to invest, but not really sure where to start, Titan takes all the guesswork out of investing by actively managing your money for you. With Titan, you can ride shotgun along with a team of dedicated, experienced analysts as they allocate your money for you and let you in along the way. Titan is the first investment platform for everyday investors that want their money actively managed by a team of experts. They offer three equity portfolios and America's first actively managed crypto portfolio. Since launching each portfolio, Titan has outperformed the benchmark in three of four portfolios on an after fees basis. They aim to grow your investments 15% annually, which would imply that you're doubling your wealth every five years net of fees. You'll even see exactly how your money is managed through video, audio, and written updates on their mobile app. Join the smarter way to invest with Titan. All it takes is $100 to get started. Right now, if you use my URL linked in the description below, titan.com slash TIP, you'll get your first three months of investment management for zero fees. 
That's titan.com slash TIP for zero fees. In the art market, it's, it's, it's always historically been, been impossible to equally weigh because it hasn't been securitized, right? So if you want to build a portfolio of art, you have to buy a $50 million Basquiat, a $30 million Rothko, you know, a $5 million Cecily Brown, a $1 million Gunter Ford, like whatever the, um, the composition is of this, the size of paintings, but it's always been impossible to equally weigh. So now for the first time ever, with us securitizing, securitizing paintings, people can build equally weighted portfolios uh, on the Masterworks website. But I do think an, an ETF product that followed some similar methodology could be, could be interesting. That is super interesting. And to your point, if you back test things, and they do exist now, but say even the S&P 500 equally weighted instead of market cap weighted, it's compelling, um, mainly because if you think about it, the market weight means that, you know, say a company like Apple, that's $3 trillion. I mean, could it go up another $3 trillion? Possibly, but the <laughs> probabilities are that it's going to be a drag, you know, on the overall index, uh, which is, you know, yet to be seen. But we are... But it's really interesting to think about it in a very similar fashion. Um, how do you think about diversification more generally speaking in the art market, especially if you're just getting started in it? I mean, diversification matters. Diversification matters just like any, any other asset class. I, I always tell investors to assume that you're going to be investing in, in 10 paintings over time. Um, you know, I think our, our research suggests that eight paintings is kind of the minimum that, that you, you would really want to invest in to gain, to gain adequate exposure. Um, so 10 plus would be, would be great, but you know, we, we bring so many paintings to the platform now, again, one, every, every five and a half days on average, it, it's, it's better to just wait, um, over time and, you know, find the right opportunities. Now I just came up with a merchandise idea for you, which is a 10 hole punch card. So for example, Warren Buffett used to say, <laughs> Warren Buffett would say you should invest like you have a 20 hole punch card and you can only buy 20 companies. So you're saying 10. I'm even yeah. more impressed. So maybe you should sell that on your site. We can keep track. <laughs> Speaking of Buffett and, and other billionaires, I know that Steve Cohen, for example, is a big art collector and has, I think, over a billion dollars worth of art, which is staggering. What would it take for a piece of art itself to become worth over a billion dollars? And are we, are we there yet? Are we getting close to it? Oh yeah. I mean, I, I think we're, I think we're really close to it. So we, the most expensive painting ever was this Da Vinci painting, uh, which sold for $450 million. And that was, I think an unexpected result. I, I, don't, I don't think really the, the art world expected the painting to sell, uh, for quite that much, but you know, I, I guess from my perspective, and obviously I'm I'm biased, but I I I don't think it would be that surprising for a painting to sell for a billion dollars. Um, you know, clearly if the Mona Lisa were up for sale, that would sell for significantly over a billion dollars. So those those paintings exist. I think the thing that's so surprising about the art market when people hear that a painting sold for four hundred fifty million dollars is not necessarily the price tag, right? Like there's lots of things that are $450 million. Bridges cost $450 million. Buildings cost $450 million. The difference is that in the art market, you really have one person buying that painting for $450 million, which is staggering, right? And every other asset class, there's consortiums of people that buy these, these very expensive things together. Um, so I think, you know, our view is that as these assets become securitized, it will be easier for for some of these paintings that are very valuable to find buyers in the in the billion dollar plus range um, if they're collect you know co uh, collectives of of investors. Going back to the correlation a little bit more, I'm kind of curious because what you said just struck something for me, which is, you know, if it's uncorrelated to the S and P 500, but also correlated to say the wealth effect, as I understand it. Um, you know, when we were studying wine, I, I look at it in a similar way where the price of wine kind of tends to go up more correlated to the markets, it seems, because it generates this wealth effect and people can then leverage or sell or whatever and create liquidity to buy, to diversify into something like art. So with the S with the markets going, you know, maybe entering recession territory, we're not sure yet. Do you think that will have a drag on the art market, just generally speaking? 
Well, I think I think recessions in general, um, you know, are always problematic for every asset class. So I, you just have to say that say that broadly. Um, but if you look at the correlation between the between art prices and the S and P, as as you mentioned historically, it's been negligible. And uh, you know what we saw even during COVID was was that art prices not only increased but increased at rapid rates. I mean, we saw. In the depths of COVID, in, in March of 2020, uh, something like 20 artist markets set price records. Um, you know, that's that's 180 degrees opposite of of what you would expect. And I and I think the reality is, for better or for worse, the top one percent on a global basis just just wasn't impacted by COVID. Arguably, benefited. Um, so it, you know, it, it, I, I do think that our prices are are correlated to this the the wealth effect as as you describe it, um, and as long as there's more billionaires being created, and as long as the people that are are buying art are getting wealthier, we continue to expect prices to go up. You mentioned that the Mona Lisa would probably fetch a billion dollars or more easily. Why does someone like the Louvre? not securitize it maybe through you maybe they could leverage your platform and sell even a piece of it to fund other activities or other art purchases has anyone approached you about that well you know it's interesting we, we had during covid um the contemporary uh, uh art museum in uh the netherlands i think I, i'm getting the name specifically wrong uh was having financial the museum of contemporary art in the netherlands was having financial problems and we um we went in and we agreed to buy a Banksy from them. And then we turned around and we lent the Banksy to them. So you can go and see that, see that Banksy today, still, still hanging on their walls. Um, now at some point that painting will sell and, you know, investors will get proceeds and that the painting will have to leave the museum. But I do think it's an, it's an interesting strategy for museums who want to raise capital, um, retain the painting uh, over the next several years, potentially maybe have a, you know, a right of first refusal if someone does make an offer to buy the painting for the museum to raise the capital um, and continue to hold it internally. But um, yeah, I mean, there, there's so much art that's trapped up in museums and frankly, so much in storage that's never even displayed that it, it does seem like at some point museums should be more rational about deaccessioning I think I think there's just always been concerns about um, you know the the museum's role in society and and selling works of art that should belong to the public. Um, yeah, you know, on the topic of galleries, you have a gallery in, in Soho, as I believe it. Is that just overflowing at this point with art? And at what point is <laughs> are you going to continue to open up more and more galleries to make it more like a, a museum aspect across the country? Or what, what's the strategy there? It's, it's, it's a good question. We get asked that, the, this question all the time by investors. So I, I, I prefer not to answer it right now because I, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to commit to anything. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we do have a gallery. We actually moved offices, so we're no longer in Soho, but we do have a gallery at our, our new office space in Brookfield Place, um, kind of in downtown New York. But uh, yeah, I mean, we we bring art in selectively. The majority of art is still in storage. It's very hard to um, to display the vo the volume of art that that we're buying. But you know, one initiative this year is to to frankly get better at building relationships with museums or institutions and and trying to um, to let more paintings live in public spaces. All right. So I'm really eager to talk to you about the metaverse because last time <laughs> you and I spoke, I mean, the Beeple had just sold for $69 million. It was really the first NFT to do something like that. And But NFTs, even at that time, weren't really being taken all that seriously. I'm not sure they should be even now, but I'm wondering if your mind has changed on NFTs in any way. Are our, our thinking is is definitely uh, evolving with NFTs. I think I think our position is probably still the same, but I'll, I'll I'll walk you through I guess how we how we think about it today. So when when we think about art or any other asset class, we think about it very fundamentally, and and we ask ourselves two questions. One, uh, can can we demonstrate that it beats inflation? 
And two, can we demonstrate that it lacks correlation with other, other asset classes? And that's just, you know, that's kind of finance 101, should something be included in a portfolio? Um, and they have to meet those two criteria. And I think the challenge that people always forget with, with NFTs is that, sure, they've shot way up in value. They actually collapsed for, for those who remember after they shot up in value, and then they subsequently shot up in value again. Um, we don't see that as, as a predictable trend line. Um, we, we see that as, as highly volatile. So could be interesting to speculate. I, I don't personally know how to speculate on that market. Like I, our, our team doesn't have doesn't have that experience. Um, when you think about the, the second point of correlation, I do think this one is changing. So I think historically we would have said NFTs are correlated to Ethereum, which is correlated to Bitcoin, which is correlated to public equities. Um, we, we haven't looked at this recently, but it does feel like uh, that that correlation dynamic is improving, that NFTs are less correlated to Ethereum now than they, they were many months ago. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think our view is that it's still early um, as NFTs evolve, you know, a, as we see more predictable price increases, perhaps it's a strategy we could consider. It's probably a strategy we would consider as part of a fund rather than specific individual investments uh, just to reduce the, the, the risk or the volatility. Um, but that's, that's how we're thinking about it today. Now, for someone like you who's put in real work to legitimize your products and to legally securitize the pieces of art, I think it took you over a year you know, just to securitize your first one. Does the opaqueness of the NFT industry bother you at all? Like, you know, the, you know, the fact that it just seems very, you know, I don't know, questionable, I guess is a good, a good word for it. It, it, it that, I mean, that's an excellent question. I, I, <laughs> I'm struggling with how to answer this. So I, I think, I, th I think the, the truthful answer is yes. And that's a, that's a personal opinion, you know, more so than a masterworks opinion. But I think the challenge that I have personally with crypto is that is it, it's an, it's entirely unregulated. Um, and regardless of, of your perspective on, on regulation and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, generally conservative when I think when I think about things like like regulation but in securities there has to be some regulation uh, and and in, and in crypto there's there's really none so you you know you see major players influencing markets in ways that 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 just hurt retail investors um, so I you know I, I do think that's fair that you have to always be very cautious with a lot of the data that you see in crypto markets because it is highly manipulated um, by small, small numbers of people. Now, I noticed that one of the VCs that came in on your Series A is focused on the Web3 tech world. Are there plans for Masterworks to somehow play a role in that new innovation of sorts, so to speak? Well, you know, I think I think one of our blind spots continues to be this this NFT space. So um, we we did uh, kind of let Mike Mike Novogratz and the Galaxy crowd come into um, the fundraise with with the thought that they're much smarter than we are on on crypto and and NFTs. Um, and we continue continue to explore that with them. We've got a meeting uh, next week with them to continue to talk about it. So I think. You know, our view is that we want people around the table that understand things that we frankly don't understand. Um, and that was really, really why we, we, we brought them in. And going back to galleries, could you see a world where there are galleries with digital TVs on the wall displaying NFTs at some point in the near future in the physical world? Yeah, I mean, you, you could. You know, one of the, one of the features that were... Uh, contemplating right now, which I personally think would be really cool, is individual user profiles at Masterworks where um, it's www.masterworks.io forward slash Scott Lynn, and that effectively displays your art collection. And then you can click and go into a virtual gallery to see your art collection. You can share it with friends, you, you know, you can keep it for yourself. But it, it is, we, we've done this with a handful of paintings. And while it seems, you know, 
like a bit of a, I don't know, kind of web point three feature on the surface, it is really interesting to see paintings at scale that you've invested in, in context with one another. Um, frankly, some of the paintings that people are investing in are, are giant, right? They're 10 feet tall and 12, 13 feet wide. And people don't realize that until they, they see it in more of a, a virtual environment or, or the real world. So I think there are features like that that could be, could be, could be pretty cool and frankly, relatively simple to implement. Yeah, I imagine the quote unquote community aspect of Web3 could be really interesting for Masterworks because you can find communities of people who have similar interests. Say, for example, they might all own a Basquiat or the same Basquiat if they have a fractional share in it. And uh, that could really bring people together in some aspect. Have you considered that as part of this uh, development as well? We have, and we, we also think about those those kind of like you know we we refer to them generally as lifestyle um lifestyle uh, opportunities we've thought about this in the real world i mean we we now have i think uh 5, plus investors in new york city feels like you know we should have some some uh venue gallery restaurant members only club at some point Discord channel <laughs> <laughs> that people can come and see see these paintings right i mean we've raised uh whatever over 100 million dollars from people in new york city alone it, w- it would be great to do something in the real world where they can experience what they what they own i've been really eager to talk to you about this and i don't know if you followed it at all but there are these things now called DAOs, right decentralized autonomous organizations there was this one that raised, I think, $45 million within maybe a day or two to then go and buy this copy of the Constitution. It's called Constitution <laughs> Dow. And it got a lot of traction, a lot of press. And, and very transparently, to their credit, on their website, it talked about how you weren't really buying a piece of the Constitution. You were buying what was called a, a voting right, essentially, on a, where to park the thing, basically. To, you would have some say as to where to put it. And it, it just raised a lot of questions around like who actually owns the piece of art once it, you know, it, it almost in that sense felt a little bit like, you know, a, a Kickstarter campaign for somebody to go th- <laughs> and buy this thing. Talk to us about how Masterworks is different from that. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, that there's, there's a lot of, a lot of these, these, these Dow, DAOs or Dow-like concepts, I think that um, are, are trying to provide some lifestyle component or some, you know, interaction with the object without actually having ownership. And, and we're fundamentally an investment platform, right? I mean, our, our view, again, is that this is the largest asset class that's never been securitized. Characteristically, it, it historically has outperformed public equities. It has negligible correlation. It deserves a role in a portfolio. I think when we we think about our, our measurement of success, it's it's 10, 20 years from now, investors hold a couple percent of a portfolio in art. Um, that's very different than than how the crypto world is functioning today, right? I'm I'm not sure why people are spending millions of dollars on tokens to grant them voting rights or access to see something, right? Like if I'm if I'm spending millions of dollars on something, I want it to be an investment and have have intrinsic value. Yeah, I agree. (laughs) Um, Now, you did say your team, they're not experts, say, on this NFT space yet, but do have you seen any comparisons in that space that do make sense to you as far as um, the valuations of a certain piece of art or the, you know, scarcity, uh, so to speak? Or is there something there that you're starting to see that says, okay, yeah, I could see why that makes sense? You know, unfortunately, it's really the opposite. So when we when we think about cultural significance, and I think that's the the right way to to, to characterize your question. In the traditional art world, we think about uh, three different things, which are which are all quantifiable. One is which museums collect that given artist. Uh, one is what other important artist does that artist exhibit with, and then one is how global is the demand for a given artist. So obviously with NFTs, NFTs are, are global by nature. So I'm, I'm not sure, you know, that one's really relevant. Um, the other two, I struggle with a bit more. I mean, if you, if you look at historically who the tastemakers are and who decides what is culturally significant, museums play a very large role in that. 
and and museums really haven't um, haven't accepted, I guess, for lack of a better word, NFTs generally. So we don't we don't see curators or critics from that world stepping into um, to to welcoming you know NFTs or putting together exhibitions on NFTs yet. That that could change, um, but yet we 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 haven't seen it. So I think those are the signals that we're looking for. When when do institutions really start to buy NFTs? When do they start to build shows around them? Uh, from an artist perspective, what are the NFT artists that are doing things different? That are doing things interesting, unlike other artists. I mean, there's a lot of these NFTs that I look at that are totally underwhelming uh, you know they look they look like they could be done by a third grader so i don't of course people say that about our paintings right we, we you know we bring these Objective. 20 million dollar boss gets to the platform and people say oh my kid could do that so i don't maybe maybe i'm now that person but um yeah that's 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 how we think about it i guess well given that there are now all these billionaires and gazillionaires in the crypto space you even have you know 15 year olds in the nft space that are making millions of dollars now you know, if you thought about getting them into onto your platform, have you considered accepting things like Bitcoin or Ethereum just to, you know, convert onto your platform for ownership of a of a piece of real work? Yeah, we we do accept crypto via BitPay, um, so we we'll, we take crypto as a payment method. Um, you know, it's interesting with with a lot of NFT people, we we just don't. Uh, sorry, with a lot of crypto people, we just don't see them diversifying away from crypto. I mean, it, even these, it, it, I was talking to uh, one of the, the heads of, of um, uh, one of the you know, largest private banks in the world. Um, and he was talking about a lot of new clients that they're getting that are all crypto billionaires and how they just can't get them to diversify away from crypto in any way, shape or form. And, you know, on a, on a smaller scale, we see the same thing, uh, which I think is a little bit unfortunate because you know, I, I don't know, personally, I've lived through three financial crises. And I think until you live through one, you don't totally appreciate uh, the need for diversification. But most people that have created wealth in crypto really haven't haven't seen that dynamic yet. One maybe comparison that, that I thought I would share with you that maybe I want your opinion on is the fact that you mentioned Monet is I think the best-selling art, uh, it was certainly the highest bid, that $450 million piece of work that sold. But I think in general, he's one of the top-selling uh, artists in the world. And the question is around awareness. So when you, when you think about the value, you, you would, it's easy to think about scarcity. But if you think about Monet, you know, his paintings are printed on posters that are sold in Urban Outfitters. I mean, they are they are everywhere. They're ubiquitous at this point. And so there's a lot of awareness about him. And even though that there are these really cheap, you know, uh, replicas or facsimiles of his art distributed around the world, it doesn't seem to distract from the value he has of his real works. And in the same way, the fact that an NFT could be a JPEG and distributed, uh, you know, at, at Infinium, um, do you see a correlation there between awareness of an artist and value, even though the actual work could be distributed in a, in a lot of different ways? It's an, it's an interesting question. We've never been able to, to measure that, but I have to believe it, it has an impact. I mean, other artists that we see a similar dynamic with uh, are artists like Cause, who has a huge Instagram following, uh, really, really became popular through, through Instagram, and, and that's helped that's helped him build build his market. Uh, you know, Monet, interestingly, is is the only one of the very few impressionists who we consider in, investable. Right, he outperforms significantly outperforms most other impressionist artists, and and perhaps that's why his brand continues to just live on uh, much larger than other other artists. Like Van Gogh would be another another example, but he he, he painted far far fewer paintings. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we haven't quantified it, but it, but it, but it, it seems like that would be the case. That's interesting. You haven't quantified it. So even looking at like Google trends or something, just, you know, really back of envelope stuff, uh, would you be looking into the, the overall internet interest in something like a certain artist? Yeah, we, 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 you know, it's funny. We, we spent a lot of time with Google trends data. We've never been able to really, to really correlate 
uh, increase in, increase in Google Trends with eventual increase in prices. And an example is 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 the uh, the Banksy the Banksy sale or the the painting shredded right. So that was the all time peak when people were searching for Banksy and couldn't figure out you know how how this work of art shredded itself uh, a couple of years ago, and you know that that really was just kind of general retail interest, but had nothing to do with his his market or prices. Now, does your platform inform participants about how many works are actually publicly available, you know, from a certain artist? Because I think that's such an interesting metric. Like even the Da Vinci's, I think there was two that aren't, you know, held by museums of that one piece of, you know, they're just so rare. I feel like that's such an important metric if you're considering buying into an artist. Is that displayed on the website? It's not just what on the website. It's a metric that we uh, are going through uh, through painstaking effort to collect across all these artist markets internally. It's very hard to collect because, you know, you you have to you have to understand how many paintings the artist painted to begin with, and then throughout time you have to track uh, declining supply by paintings going into institutions. So individual artist markets can take you know weeks on their own just to to collect data for for one market. Um, but it is it is it is something we look at internally, but we we don't we don't share it once we once we collect it. All right, last question about the metaverse. So, <laughs> Masterworks comes in and democratizes access to these unbelievable works of art, which is so cool. But uh, the Web three aspect is all about decentralization, right? So, is there a world where Masterworks itself is disrupted because artists are now interacting right with the participants or investors directly just on a blockchain somewhere. I think that's really NFTs, right? I mean, it's when artists create NFTs, they, they can sell them directly to someone uh, via the blockchain. Now, you know, I, I, I can, I can safely say that from being in the art market for a long time and knowing lots of artists, like many artists struggle with the, all of the commercial aspects of, of the art market, right? They're very good at, painting paintings, but they don't know how to price them. They don't know how to find collectors to, to buy them. So they work with galleries and, and galleries really have taken on that role for, for over a hundred years. Um, so I, you know, I, I don't know if that's a problem that blockchain solves. It clearly solves the ability to, to just complete the transaction. But I think, you know, in terms of, of kind of representing the artist, communicating the story, finding, the right collectors, building out museum interest, building out collector interest. Um, there's probably still an intermediary that's that's required for an artist. All right, Scott, I love having you on the show. I always learn a ton and this did not disappoint. So thank <laughs> you so much for coming on again and especially entertaining uh, my, my thoughts on the Web3 space. All right. For those looking to get interested in this, maybe for the first time, what are the best resources that you would recommend either through your platform or otherwise uh, before they get started? Yeah, so they can, you can go to Masterworks, www.masterworks.io, create an account, schedule a call with our membership team. Uh, Our membership team walks you through suitability, talks about how you're investing today, what your risk tolerance is, um, you know, makes recommendations around specific artists, how to think about art as part of your overall portfolio, it's really the best place to get started. They can point you to, to third-party resources um, as well. City does some great research on the art market. Um, our research team partners with a lot of other private banks. Some of that is, is linked to on our website. Um, but yeah, I would, I would just start, start slow, start small, diversify over time is, is really the right, right way to, to get involved. Scott, really appreciate the time. Thanks for coming on the show. Let's do it again. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below. 